When we think of great Italian directors, names such as Fellini, Antonioni and De Sica pop up. But what about those that didn't get the fame they expected? What about the directors who did the complete opposite? When we think of those, we think of the legendary Mario Bava, Lucio Fulci and Dario Argento. But there was one out of all of those that really stood out to me and took me into a rabbit hole that didn't stop anywhere. A man that contributed to genres such as spaghetti westerns, war movies, swashbucklers, peplum movies, fantasy movies and many many others. As well as hardcore pornography movies later on in his life, but stick around for that part later on in this video. That man is Joe De Amato, also known as Donna Albert, Stephen Benson, Anna Bergman, Ricardo Billy, John Bird, Enrico Birbici, Jim Black, Alexander Borsky, and the list goes on. Joe D'Amato actually has over 100 pseudonyms to his credit, but he also went by his real name, Aristide Massachese. To quote him himself, I changed my name many many times, mainly for the European market, because it makes the movies seem like they're American or British. It's better for European distribution that they seem that way. But for the sake of simplicity, let's just call him Joe. Having worked on more than 400 films in the span of around 40 years, he himself would go on and direct a total of around 200 films in his life. I will be skipping over a few things here and there because if I'd go over his entire filmography, I'd be here for quite a while. So, without further ado, let's enter the world of Joe de Amato. Joe D'Amato, then named Aristide Mosacesi, was born on December 15, 1936 in Rome, Italy. When Joe was about 14 years old, he would go on and see Lamberto Bava, the grandson of Eugenio Bava and the son of Mario Bava, where he would have a lab where he designed movie credits. This would be Joe's very first job in the movie industry. After that, he would move on and work as a photographer with his father's friend, Francesco Alessi. Joe also later worked with his father, who was an electrician, for about a year, but it was a difficult period for the both of them and they needed money. Moll Richardson, another motion picture company that rented cameras, was looking for someone to work as an assistant cameraman and D'Amato jumped at the opportunity. Starting in 1969, he worked as a director of photography as well as an assistant director for a number of films until 1974. These films include Hercules in a Haunted World by Mario Bava, Contempt by Jean-Luc Godard, The Golden Coach by Jean Renoir, and Challenge to White Fang by Lucio Fulci, where he was a cinematographer. D'Amato was supposed to be directing a sequel to this film which Lucio Fulci was already doing. When D'Amato was in Canada shooting a sleigh ride sequence for this film, the film's producer, Hermano Donati, asked him to stay and direct the film Red Coats for him, in which Joe used the pseudonym Joe D'Amato for the first time. Redcoats was Joe's first chance with a high budget and basically built the entire story around the unused footage from the sled scene that Joe made for White Fang. George Eastman, a great friend of Joe's who I will be talking about in a bit, wrote the script for Redcoats in two days and was in turn loosely based on White Fang as well. Eastman and Joe both comically recall that when George was writing Redcoats, Joe used to feed him chicken for three days straight to keep him awake and finish his script as fast as possible. But in 1972, he would go ahead and make his first film, a low-budget spin-off of the Trinity series named Stay Away From Trinity When It Comes To El Dorado. This film would be directed under the pseudonym Dick Spitfire, because Joe preferred being known as a director of photography rather than a director, but after a while, he just stopped caring. The film would not be received very well, neither would anyone really pay attention to it, but Joe recalls that it was quite ahead of its time. Joe also describes this film as sort of a joke. For this film, they used a lot of stock footage. A friend of Joe's, Diego Spataro, had produced some westerns and had lots of spare footage that he lent to Joe, like people being shot and falling from rooftops. 
They made this film in about three or four days, reusing said spare footage. The Amato took interest in Pasolini's film titled The Decameron, which was released in 1971. He liked this idea of an anthology film and decided to make a few spin-offs of these films, one in particular titled More Sexy Canterbury Tales. These films would be released under the genre called Decamerotics. Joe would be a pioneer of this particular genre. He would go on and direct another handful of spaghetti westerns and erotic exploitation films with actors such as Klaus Kinski, who played in a war film called Heroes in Hell, and the horror film Death Smiles on a Murderer. Laura Jamser, who played their lead role in her own film series called Emmanuel, and George Eastman, who was a good friend of Job, whom he worked with for many, many years and many, many films later on in his life. Keep his name in mind, because he is crucial to the Joe D'Amato lore. Joe built the story around Heroes in Hell because of the bought stock footage. For this film, he called himself Mikael Wartruba, because directors from Eastern Europe at that time were quite positively acclaimed. Franco Gaudenzi, a production designer and a great friend of D'Amato, bought lots of stock footage during this period from different genre films, and Joe decided to basically make a few movies based around that footage. Some of these movies include the aforementioned Heroes in Hell, which came out in 1974, and Fists, Pirates and Karate, which was released earlier in 1972, the latter of which he made in six days. 1976 would be the year that started one of Joe's most prolific and erotic film series to come. Literally. Namely, Emmanuel. Laura Jemser, the would-be D'Amato Emmanuel film star, first rose to fame as the journalist Emmanuel in Vito Albertini's Black Emmanuel. Joe had already made an Emmanuel film, but without Laura. This film's title was Emmanuel and Francoise. Franco Gaudenzi, which we just mentioned, heard that Laura's agent wanted her to act in more Italian movies because her fame almost exploded in Italy because of the original Emmanuel. Joe and Gaudenzi went to see her in Brussels and talked the whole night about their project. The Emmanuel movies usually take place in very exotic locations and they once even crossed the whole world for the film Emmanuel Around the World. Joe and Laura would become lifelong friends and partners they would end up and make five Emmanuel films together. To avoid copyright though, Joe very cleverly titled these films Emmanuel with one M, when the original was called Emmanuel with two M's. The first Emmanuel they made together was titled Emmanuel in Bangkok, which was then followed by Emmanuel in America, which was then followed by Emmanuel around the world, which was then followed by Emmanuel and Last Cannibals, which was finally concluded with Emmanuel and the white slave trade. The series was obviously notable for its strong content of nudity and often gore. But sometimes, if the movie was too softcore, foreign countries would ask Joe to add more nudity and sexual content, because the viewers of those countries enjoyed that quite a bit in the mid-70s. France especially, might I add. They shot Emmanuel on the last cannibals in Fogliano in Italy and hired Filipinos from Rome, put some wigs on them and pretended they were natives from the Amazon. Emmanuel in America consisted of a snuff sequence, which caused Joe a lot of trouble. I'm obviously not gonna show the scene, but I can describe it euphemistically. Joe had heard about these so-called snuff films on 8mm and decided that he wanted to create something in that direction. They then shot the scene on 35mm and purposely scratched the film in order to make it look as if it had been shot on 8mm. The scene shows a woman getting her breasts cut off. This was of course fake, as it was a fake snuff scene. The actress in this scene later went on to actually sue Joe and the crew, claiming that she was left traumatized despite the fact that the scene had been carefully planned and shot. The actress said it was too brutal and realistic, and therefore she had been shocked by it and asked for compensation. Joe had his passport then taken for 5 years and eventually paid her off. Laura Jemser and Joe D'Amato were very, very close friends. The artistic relationship between the two sadly ended in the early 90s when Laura decided to retire after the death of her husband. After that, Laura was still working with Joe and only now as a costume designer. The blood and gore of Emmanuel and Francoise were quite shocking for its time, actually. Not only because of the abundance of blood and gore, but also because the film briefly showed George Eastman's genitalia. 
The film's theme was cannibalism, but would only resurface sometime later in his films and not only for horror. Emanuele, sorelline, io ci entrai per caso perché lui aveva un copione doveva fare questo film. Il copione era corto e mi chiese di dargli un'occhiata. Io ammetto di rubare l'idea da un altro vecchio film e inserì quella storia di quest'uomo che viene chiuso in gabbia poi, eccetera, eccetera, che è un vecchio film francese, prima ancora greco, è un'idea che è stata copiata un paio di volte. E, e lui mi offrì il ruolo. Io non lo volevo fare, però il film, specialmente il ruolo mio, si ambientava nella villa di uno dei produttori che stava veramente a 5 minuti da casa mia. <ride> allora, siccome mi davano i soldi, allora ho detto vabbè, vorrà dire che la mattina invece di andare a prendermi il cappuccino, vado lì, giro le mie scene e me ne vengo a casa. L'ho fatto per questo motivo, però io non l'ho mai visto il film, non ho una più pallida idea di cosa sia uscito fuori. Dubito che con Aristide ci sia stato qualche film in cui lui si sia sforzato di fare delle inquadrature o di... Ma, e non ce lo vedo in questo, in questo ruolo. Il suo ruolo principale era quello di, di sbrigarsi. Noi finivamo... Ci sono stati dei film in cui... Eh, erano film fatti a scatola chiusa cioè lui prendeva i soldi e girava il film spesso e volentieri andava talmente veloce che finivamo molto prima del tempo lui questo non lo poteva andare a dire al distributore perché se diceva allora che cazzo ti hai fatto i soldi una volta venne il distributore sul set e noi non avevamo una mazza lui ha fatto finta di girare delle scene senza pellicola in macchina, ce l'ha spiegato, ce l'ha detto, e abbiamo fatto sta sceneggiata per il distributore. Era fatto così. Joe describes directing his first erotic film as As I told you before, each one of us has a peculiar conception of eroticism. Turning your fantasies into images onto the big screen, then you've created something which is erotic. I mentioned George Eastman earlier. He was born and known formally as Luigi Montefiori and was an important figure in the 70s and 80s, starting out in spaghetti westerns and later in B-movie horror flicks as well as appearing in other movies by well-renowned directors. Towering just over 2 meters, he was often casted as monsters, cannibals and apes. Films such as Fellini's Satyricon, Rabbit Dogs, Erotic Night of the Living Dead and 2019 After the Fall of New York. Eastman wrote and co-produced a lot of them out of his films, such as Anthropophagus, Erotic Nights of the Living Dead, Porno Holocaust, Absurd or known in other countries as Monster Hunter, Caligula 2, and 2020 Texas Gladiators. It's been told that Joe's relationship with George Eastman was always a love-hate one. Joe tells us that George always had different views and was more stubborn than him. They often struggled for ideas and George ended up being more right than wrong most of the time. <laughs> ha come base, diciamo, il, la, la, prof, la profonda simpatia che io avevo per lui. Era un personaggio che mi faceva ridere. E lo trovavo in un ambiente un po' sussiegoso, come quello del cinema, tu, dove tutti si davano una certa importanza. Un personaggio estremamente semplice, diretto nel parlare, buono, soprattutto buono, perché Ari era veramente una persona buona. Il nostro rapporto si è sviluppato nel tempo non con una continuità costante. But this is not a video on George Eastman obviously, but it's too important to not explain a little and give some backstory. Eastman was an integral figure in the Maros film world as he always provided the necessary tidbits in his films. Script writing, props, acting, you name it, and Eastman has done it and helped in the most important works of D'Amato. Earlier, I also mentioned the film Dead Smells on a Murderer. This stars the aforementioned Klaus Kinski, who very briefly appears playing a strange doctor who is trying to create a formula that will bring the dead back to life. The main story is based around a carriage wreck where a young woman is left without her memory, so she stays with a husband and wife who both take sexual liking to her. 
Later, the wife kills the young woman, but soon she reappears, them having no clue how or what just happened. Basically, this film makes little to zero sense, but it's quite a trip actually. With Death Smiles on a Murderer, Joe signed his own name on it because the genre and the themes really interested him. Later, during his 70s period, he would continue making Emmanuel films with Laura Gemser and other forgettable and unforgettable X-rated films, depending on what person you're asking. When almost entering his 80s period, the Amaro made undoubtedly one of his best films. Actually, in a time span of a year, he made two of his best films. These were Beyond the Darkness and Anthropophagus, both of which were banned in Germany. Beyond the Darkness was actually banned in three other countries, as well as including UK, which have a history of banning these types of films. There is no actual way to segue into these films, so let's get it on with Anthropophagus. Das Meer ist nicht sehr bewegt, ne? Jetzt. Ja, ja, aber ist schön, ist uh, sehr warm. Ja, findest du? Ja, gehen wir schwimmen später. The film starts out with a German couple hanging out on a beach on a small Greek island. The woman goes out for a swim while the man is jamming out with his headphones. He then suddenly gets his head blown in with a hatchet by a strange entity when we literally cut to the next scene. May I also note that the theme of this film is low-key in homage to the Zorba the Greek theme? Sometime later, a young group of tourists on a holiday that were coincidentally enough friends of the couple we first saw in the beginning of the film arrive in Athens and travel to an island that is deserted or at least has no one alive on it. They meet a young woman named Julie who asks for a ride to a nearby island since she missed the boat going there. They agree except for Carol who senses danger which is confirmed when she does a tarot card reading. When they near the island, most of the group heads out to explore and meets Julie's friend with the exception of the sailor on the boat and Maggie who is pregnant and in no mood to walk around. While the group is gone, the sailor is beheaded and his head is kept in a bucket for safekeeping and Maggie is abducted. They start to investigate and try to find out what happened and hopefully find someone alive. They catch a glimpse of a mysterious woman lurking through the window until they finally stumble upon a hysterical blind girl named Henriette, the blind daughter of Judy's friend, hiding in a vat of wine as she attacks them. Henriette tells them of a monster whose presence she can only smell from the odor of the blood it carries. From there on, the movie gradually gets much more intenser and freaky. The members of the group from that point on are then gradually picked off by something which is eventually revealed to us to be a disfigured and insane George Eastman. The build up to the first sighting of the monster is about an hour into the film and builds it up maybe a bit too much. We get a backstory sometime after this as well showing what the cannibalistic murderer was up to before all of this. We learn that Klaus Wortmann and his family were stranded in a raft after being shipwrecked and that Klaus accidentally stabbed his wife while trying to convince her that they should maybe eat the body of their dead son to survive. Klaus then ate his wife's and son's corpses, driving him insane. This film is also subject to maybe one of the most disturbing horror scenes ever. Let me set the stage. After waking, Carol, Andy and Arnold look out a window and see that the boat has drifted close to the shore. The two men go to rescue the vessel, and Julie finds a partially destroyed journal among the objects in the mansion, and it reveals that the killer is Klaus and that the bodies of all of Klaus's victims are in a hidden room. Andy and Arnold split up, and the latter reaches an abandoned church where he finds Maggie and is confronted by Klaus. Klaus then calms himself, then stabs Arnold and simultaneously strangles Maggie to death. As Arnold slowly dies, he watches in horror as Klaus rips out and eats Maggie's unborn child. Let me note by the way that the fetus is actually a skinned rabbit. They bought it off a local butcher and shaped it in a way that resembled an actual fetus. But yeah, it actually gets better. Julie uncovers the room where Klaus's victims are at the mansion and skims another diary she finds in it. Carol then stumbles into the chamber and drops dead from a slit throat. Klaus then attacks Julie, who locks herself and Henriette in the attic after a short chase. 
Klaus breaks through the ceiling and kills Henriette and is then knocked off the roof by Julie and falls into a well. When Julie peers down the well, Klaus attacks her, but she is saved when Andy appears and stabs Klaus in the stomach with a pickaxe, causing the cannibal's intestines to spill out. As a last dying act, Klaus starts feasting on his own intestines, staring at Andy while Julie looks at Klaus in horror. Klaus then falls over and dies. The end. What a great story. Well, to ease the mood a little, here's George Eastman unboxing himself. Sperando che non sia niente di sconveniente. Antropofago, no. Antropofago. <ride> Oddio mio. Questo sì. Questo qui me lo metto in camera. <ride> carina. Molto carina. George Eastman, by the way, was perfect for his role. Like mentioned before, he was over 2 meters tall and had this dead look in his face that was terrifying for anyone that gazed into his eyes, especially when in his makeup. This is by far my favorite D'Amato film, just the build up alone makes the climax worth it, especially the ending of this film. Eravamo io e Claudio Bernabei. Eravamo io e Claudio Bernabei a una coppia davanti al 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 cinema Metropolitan di Roma, prima visione d'estate. Quattro persone dentro la sala, c'erano solo sti due davanti che per un po' stanno, si dimenano, ma stanno zitti, diciamo, seguono il film. Quando arriva la scena del, 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 del coniglietto strappato dal ventre, ricordo, si sono alzati con un modo di disgusto, non mi ricordo cosa hanno detto, ah, vabbè, e se ne sono andati. E il resto del film ce lo siamo visti e Claudio Perabè da solo. The movie sadly only had a two day run. Despite that, this was funnily enough also the movie that made his name abroad. This is because the film in Italy was a huge flop, while on the contrary, outside of Italy, the movie was a hit. The film was panned by critics though, like all of his films. There was never a single film the critics liked that Joe made. Ti dico una cosa molto carina di Antropofagus. C'è una scena in cui noi andiamo a girare in alcune annepi, ci sono delle catacombe romane, quindi vecchie 2000 anni fa. E, e in queste catacombe che erano delle nicchie c'erano tutte nicchie eh, nel muro, scavate nel muro dove c'erano i cadaveri dei cristiani che loro seppellivano le catacombe e, sono passati duemila anni quindi erano rimasto qualche osso un teschietto e, quando andammo a girare in questo posto io eh, mandai qualcuno a noleggiare eh, casse, eh, sacchi di juta pieni di ossa finte, chiaramente in plastica, da aggiungere alle ossa vere affinché sembrasse proprio un, una cosa molto, eh, desse proprio l'idea di una catacomba, di qualche cosa di ma, molto macabro. E infatti mettemmo tutti in questi, tutti, tutti questi loguli, mettemmo teschi, ossa affittate di plastica, ma arrivarono tre sacconi di questi di queste ossa. Eh, finimmo di girare la sera e io dissi rileviamo tutte le ossa e portiamole via. Eh, quello che fece questo, questa raccolta di ossa ha preso tutto, prese pure le ossa che erano prima veramente qui. E io mi sono trovato ancora poi adesso l'ho seppellita tutta nel, dentro casa mia, eh, dentro casa mia, nel, nel canterreno che c'ho a casa, mi sono trovato almeno eh, <ride> Eh, non so quante ossa di Cristiano insieme a quelle finte, che poi quando l'ho portata da quelle hanno riconsegnato le ossa finte, quelli hanno dato una capata, hanno visto che c'erano le ossa vere, gli hanno tirate, per cui questi hanno raccolto le ossa vere e me hanno riportate a casa perché non ho più il coraggio di riportarle, quindi mi sono trovato tutte queste ossa per casa, quindi ho costruito un piccolo ossario e con dove ciò, anzi se poi un giorno un pellegrinaggio... A sequel was made titled Absurd, or in some countries named Monster Hunter, which is a sequel slash prequel film following the same monster in a different setting. In turn, Beyond the Darkness is about a troubled rich orphan named Frank Weiler, who can't get over the sudden tragic death of his fiancée Anna. Frank digs up Anna's corpse and takes it back home with him. 
Frank then later starts the process of preserving Anna's body, which is quite a sight to behold. Later, Iris, his smitten and domineering housekeeper, helps Frank out with the disposal of a body by dismembering it and throwing the body parts into a bathtub of acid. Also as a side note, Joe fools us in the intro credits by using his real name as director of photography and then using a pseudonym as director. In Beyond the Darkness, Joe was actually accused of using real carcasses while in reality he went to the local butcher near the set and bought quote, pounds and pounds of innards. This is noticeable in one of the scenes where they would use pork rind laid over the body covering wherever it was that they were cutting and then they could do that with no worries. This film struck me as the strangest and most disturbing out of probably all of Joe's works. I would say to go ahead and watch this film for yourself, then write your own thoughts on a piece of paper, then throw it away because it still doesn't do this film justice of how just disturbing everything really is. By the end of the 70s though, erotic cinema entered a sort of deep crisis. In this period, Joe tried different genres to stay somewhat relevant in the filmmaking business. He tried genres such as adventure, demonic possession and straight horror. His films, like always, contained eroticism, even if the film was not erotically centered. Joe says, and I quote, Porn is not erotic. That's the point. An erotic movie means to spy, while porn flicks it all so evident that to me, it does not really convey any erotic emotion. Before I further continue though, what about the man? Joe, what drives him? What was he like? He was sometimes credited as the most prolific Italian filmmaker ever. According to the actors and actresses who worked with him, D'Amato was sociable, humorous, with a sense of irony, amiable and supportive. To some, he appeared like a father. Both Laura Jemster, with whom he worked with together for a long time, and Monica Zanchi, who also appeared in Emmanuel, pointed out his adventurous and playful approach to filmmaking. Jemster also remembered that D'Amato rarely got angry and that when it happened, he usually took it with irony. When deeply angered though, he would shout and curse and become insufferable. She also recalled that, much like herself, D'Amato fell asleep easily and anywhere, even in a breaks between rehearsals. Donatella Donati, his regular assistant since the mid-70s, recalled this penchant as his biggest flaw. In Cannes, she once found him asleep on the office floor. Even George Eastman recalls that during Anthropophagus... <laughs> Non mi è mai piaciuto. Io mi sono divertito anche lì perché la scena de, del fetino, la Serena Grandi, cioè più erano truculente le cose, più ridevamo. Ma onestamente se dovessi dire che possa essere fino di quei film, no. Eh. Eh, immagino avessi quando ad esempio avete girato quella scena di Colpeto che tra l'altro con un coniglio. Sì, con un coniglietto. Sì, no, no, no. Chi, chi, chi restava un po' scioccato in quei film erano gli attori per quelli che non lo conoscevano perché lui aveva un certo linguaggio abbastanza pesante ma detto con voce dolce capito? Il, che faceva un contrasto tremendo perché quando un regista ti arriva vicino eh, e ti dice con dolcezza larga e gosce <ride> e, cioè, non era un regista volgare era molto gentile nella voce ma dicendoti delle cose tremende per cui queste restavano un attimino sbalordite e non sapevano, non reagivano, e facevano, guarda, tutti facevano quello che diceva lui, riusciva a far fare tutto a tutti. We will now delve further into the 80s period of the Maru's career. This period was known for its sword and sorcery films and its post-apocalyptic films. Box office successes such as Quest for Fire, Conan the Barbarian and Clash of the Titans spurred the second renaissance of sword and sorcery Italian Pepla in the five years immediately following. Most of these films had low budgets, focusing more on barbarians and pirates so as to avoid the need for expensive Greco-Roman sets. The filmmakers tried to compensate for their shortcomings with the addition of some graphic gore and nudity, something Joe knew all about. Joe loved these films and got inspired instantly and had the urge to make something similar. He tried to reinvent the peplum genre, doing so by making it colorful and experimenting with eroticism. Peplum, for the ones that don't know, is a specific quote-unquote sword and sandal film which is affiliated with Italian cinema, sort of like how westerns and spaghetti westerns are distinguished. In 1982, Joe released his next film, aptly titled Ator the Fighting Eagle.
This was an obvious remake of the well-renowned Conan the Barbarian starring Arnold Schwarzenegger and was released just a few months after Conan had premiered. It was hastily shot, edited and released in an attempt to cash in on the success of Conan. To put it simply, the film is about a baby named Ator who is born with a birthmark that signals he will someday destroy the spider cult. The spider cult, by the way, mirrors the snake cult from the Conan film. And the cult holds power over all these lands. Fearing this prophecy, the leader of the cult, High Priest of the Ancient One Dakar, attempts to kill the baby. Ator's birthmark is covered up however and is whisked off to a village far away where he is given to a couple to raise as their own. The hero in question is played by Miles O'Keefe, and yeah, he's exactly what you think it looked like. Now, Ator is quite a strange movie, not because of the set or the clothing or makeup department, but the dialogue. For example, listen to this conversation between Ator and his love interest, Sanya. I couldn't find you. Don't leave me like that, ever. But I was in the woods. Here, I brought you a present. And I love you. Why can't we marry? Edward, we are brother and sister. I'll talk with our father. Not one dialogue in this movie feels natural. Everything is either awkward or just so plain that it feels like two oblivion NPCs talking to each other. I thought you were the Black Knights. They attacked my village. Killed my people. Stolen my wife. Yes, I know, Atto. How do you know my name? I've never seen you before. What I also like is that because the movie was on a literal shoestring budget, they couldn't afford a gigantic spider monster animatronic. So what they did was they cleverly put together some paper mache and attached some string to it and miraculously made it look like there was an actual gigantic spider. There are just a few shots with this monster where it's just idle in the background waiting for the actors to step out. The ending of the film is just marvelous, just look at this and let it speak for itself. This film, in the end, got three more sequels, where only part two and four were directed by Joe himself. The 1980s was also the time where Joe started experimenting more with the erotic side of filmography, as we have seen earlier in his films with Emmanuel. This leads us to Porno Holocaust. Yes, I know, a flattering title. There's nothing I can really say about this movie other than that everybody's sticking things in each other and a nuclear monster is wandering around chasing everybody trying to do the same thing. This would somewhat be the start of his niche in erotic hardcore horror pornography films. In this period, Joe experimented with said niche but also made a few post-apocalyptic films. These include 2020 Texas Gladiators and Endgame. These two films were cashing in not on the fame of Conan but that of Mad Max. Texas Gladiators follows a typical post-apocalyptic survival story. It starts with a bunch of chaos and the state of Texas is entirely destroyed by nuclear warfare and gangs randomly running in the streets. Luckily for the civilians, there are these beefed up warriors ready to protect them. During a fight in a monastery, one of them is banished for trying to take advantage of a girl and another one leaves voluntarily to marry and live in a community that tries to rebuild civilization. Oh yeah, it picks up from there but don't expect too much. In a 1996 interview, Damaru stated that Eastman didn't feel confident enough in the action scenes and so I dealt with those, leaving him to the direction of the actors. But in this case, the name recorded at the ministry was mine. Damaru received directing credit, although Eastman directed most of the dialogue scenes according to Damato. Eastman also stated in 1996 that, quote, These post-atomic films which were made in the wake of various Mad Max movies were decidedly crummy. 
The set designs were poor and the genre met a swift and well-deserved death. I only wrote these awful movies for financial reasons. No attempt at originality was made at all. After this particular film, the Amato also made a film titled Endgame, which roughly follows the same plot only then taking place in New York. He continued making his standard batch of films and remakes of films while things went downhill for him. The late 80s and early 90s were quite a difficult time for Joe. Italian cinema was dwindling and wrong operations forced him to close down his own company titled Filmerage. This made Joe get back into the porn industry for commercial reasons. The market kept asking Joe to make stronger erotic things which led him to make hardcore pornography. Joe admits he'd rather make other movies than pornography, but this period in his career skyrocketed his popularity and made him the leading filmmaker in the market and his name a reliable trademark for consumers. He even was embarrassed at a point in time and made other non-erotic films to keep himself balanced. Joe gained a position in the hardcore industry that he didn't want. Joe D'Amato, also known as Aristide Masachesi, sadly passed away on January 23rd, 1999. He would suffer from a heart attack that he did not recover from at the age of 62. His death happened unexpectedly while he was busy preparing for a new film. Private delle voci di debiti dovuti ad azioni sbagliate economicamente ma soprattutto fatte dalla socia di Massacesi, non da lui. E su, sulla questione di, di film che hanno fatto flop, devo dire, tutti i suoi film hanno fatto flop, perché erano tutti film che non è che pretendevano di incassare chissà che. Quando lui iniziava a girare un film, ti sto parlando dei tempi appunto di Antropofago, su Rosso Sangue, eccetera, erano film già finanziati da altri coproduttori, lui non metteva una lira, metteva il suo lavoro, metteva eh, il suo impegno, le macchine da presa, queste cose, però soldi in contanti non ne metteva, veniva sempre pagato. Ha iniziato a produrre sborsando soldi suoi quando si è messo a fare a rota di collo proprio una serie di film porno che erano, ma erano film che venivano girati in tre giorni, quattro giorni, insomma andava in America, girava 10-12 film in una settimana, e quindi insomma non si può, non lo so poi esattamente, lui una volta io gli feci un discorso, gli dissi tu puoi scegliere, c'hai due strade davanti, e te lo dico con tutta la sincerità, puoi diventare un grosso produttore se la smetti di voler fare tutto da solo, perché se fai tutto da solo finirai sempre per fare delle cose con la paura. E fai un film serio, un film vero, e sono sicuro che riuscirai, perché la sua forza era proprio quella di riuscire a suscitare la simpatia in chiunque gli parlava. Lui avrebbe potuto lavorare con qualunque distributore perché sicuramente gli avrebbe dato i soldi per poter fare il film. Però non andrò a girarlo lui. Tu sei principalmente uno, un direttore della fotografia, non sei un regista. Perché a macchina da presa ogni tanto si fa qualche bella inquadratura, ma sono inquadrature che tu copi da altri film dove hai visto quell'inquadratura e la rifai. Ma non è che fai quell'inquadratura perché hai capito che quell'inquadratura funziona emotivamente. Magari fai un'inquadratura che in un altro contesto funzionerebbe, ma in quello non c'entra assolutamente nulla. Questi discorsi io glielo ho fatti un paio di volte con serietà, ma tanto lui aveva troppa paura di mettersi nelle mani degli altri. Preferiva restare nel giro piccolo ma avere tutto sotto controllo. Questo alla lunga non paga, alla lunga non paga. Poi ha avuto il tracollo, tu sai che quando tornò dall'America l'ultimo viaggio gli avevano perso tutte le pizze, cioè, quindi gli avevano creato un danno notevole. E da lì poi credo che quella sia stata la causa principale dell'infarto che ha avuto. Poverino, mi è dispiaciuto tanto. His films garnered the attention of millions of people and became instant fans. 
They continue to amaze people like myself and have become cult classics. But the man himself also fascinates me. The career he had is one of the craziest and wackiest stories I've ever heard and I love every single part of it. Whatever he made he got a lot of satisfaction from. He was almost never disappointed by a film he made or anything, even with his pornographic films. When asked why Joe has so many fans, he replied, I never understood it really. I have yet to find a reason why. For Halloween in New Jersey, and questi si sono comprati delle fotografie mie autografate per 10 dollari. Cosa che 10 dollari sono 16.000 lire. Tu mi devi dire perché se comprano una fotografia, quando potrebbero andare, andare a comprarsi una t-shirt, una qualche cosa di più utile sicuramente, piuttosto che pagare 16.000 lire una fotografia mia con l'autografo. È incredibile. È incredibile. Non lo capisco. Ti giuro su Dio che non lo capisco. If you ever ask Joe if he thinks that he's a good director, he will always reply with that he's a better cinematographer and director of photography than a director. There's too much to discover about Joe D'Amato and Pierce, and I encourage you to go down the same rabbit hole that I went through, and trust me, it'll open a whole new world. Ti consideri più un bravo direttore della fotografia o un bravo regista? Un bravo direttore della fotografia. E come regista ti consideri un maestro dell'erotismo e dell'horror o no? Come regista mi definisco un, uh, un artigiano uh, professionale. The sheer dedication and hardships Joe went through and the love he has for cinema is really somewhat inspiring. I film che ho fatto io dieci anni fa o quindici anni fa, che adesso sono tanto ben visti, soprattutto all'estero, è un fatto secondo me nostalgico perché non se ne sono fatti più. Quindi io, Fulci, Freda... Siamo una, una categoria in via di estinzione, allora... Eppure non tutti i registi che facevano fino allora sono considerati come sei considerato tu adesso. Ma io perché non ho fatti tanti, Maglia? Non penso sia solo questo. Ti consideri cinico nei confronti di te stesso? No. Mi considero... Il tuo più grande pregio? La modestia, forse. <ride> Il tuo più grande difetto? La modestia. 